each of you that are here with us today. We are so thankful that you've joined us today at Somerville Baptist. We are thankful for each of you that are here with us today. Guests, we are especially thankful that you are here. We want each guest to leave today with a copy of the book, Hope. It's a collection of seven stories from people right here at Somerville Baptist. You'll read about the transformation in their lives that can only come from a relationship with Jesus Christ. We know that the book will be a great encouragement to you. Simply fill out the Somerville Connect card from the back of the chair in front of you and drop it off at the Welcome Center after the service. We want to invite anyone who has been our guest in the past to join Pastor Lewis and Miss Joy for a free lunch following the morning service on Sunday, August 27th at the East Campus Cafe. If you and your family would like to attend, please sign up at the bulletin board or call the church office to RSVP. If you are not already connected to a life group here at Somerville Baptist, we encourage you to pick up a list of groups from the Welcome Center. Life groups meet each Sunday morning during the 9 o'clock hour all around the campus. We get to do life together and build relationships while studying God's Word together, fellowship and serving together, and praying together. Come be a part of these groups. Men, the weekly men's Bible study will be starting back in September. Each week, we will meet at 6 a.m. at Libby's in Priceville on Thursdays and in Madison on Tuesdays. A sign-up sheet is now available at the bulletin board for you to order your copy of the book we will be studying called Disciplines of a Godly Man. Highways and Hedges is this Thursday, August 24th. Join us for our monthly outreach as we follow up with some of those that have recently visited Somerville Baptist. A meal will be served at 5.30, followed by a time of prayer before we head out at 6.30. Child care is available for those who need it. Sign up today at the bulletin board in the lobby. Each week, there are over 100 people at SBC involved in continued discipleship. Discipleship is a great way to dig into God's Word and to build a relationship with another member as you spend time together each week. If you are interested in being discipled, sign up at the bulletin board or call the church office. Please take a moment right now and check in here at Somerville Baptist on your social media page. It's a great way to invite friends and family who don't have a church home to join you for a service here at SBC. Each week, our services are streamed live on SomervilleBaptist.org. Not only is it a great outreach tool, but it's also a great way to stay connected to your church family if you're traveling or not able to be here. Awana kickoff is around the corner. On Wednesday, August 30th, the Safari kickoff will begin at 6.45 p.m. This year, we will have six-day creatures ministry with us, along with hands-on interaction with some of God's amazing creatures. If you haven't already registered your kids for Awana, please see Marsha Barton or stop by the Welcome Center as soon as possible. If you or a loved one are separated or are going through a divorce, Divorce Care is a support group that is led by someone who has been through a divorce and understands the hurt that comes from it and through the power of Jesus Christ rebuild their lives. Beginning September 6th, Divorce Care will meet each Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. at the East Campus Cafe and is open to anyone that would like to join. There are only a few spots remaining for the Holy Land trip in February 2018. It will be an unforgettable trip led by Pastor Lewis. If you are interested in going, you can contact the church office for more details. Hope Radio is available online at SomervilleBaptist.org or locally at 104.9 FM or 1310 AM. You can find hope, encouragement, and instruction as you hear great messages from the Bible and uplifting worship music 24-7. Whenever you're in the car, at home, or at work, Hope Radio will be a great blessing. We are so thankful that you have joined us today. Isaiah 25, 1 says, O Lord, thou art my God. I will exalt thee, I will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things. Join us now as we worship and give praise to our Lord for all that he gives us.
Amen. Beautiful choir. Let's stand together this evening and sing together. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this time? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood in the soul? together as a church. I want you to be ready in just a few minutes to uh, share praises, words of testimony. And that's always encouraging to the rest of the church body. And then we'll look into the word in Joshua chapter 7 as we go through the rest of the service. And we praise the Lord for those who accepted Christ as Savior this morning, those that joined the church. It's been a great Sunday. And so we're looking forward to, as we come to the end of this Sunday, for him to show us from his word what we need to change, how we need to adjust our lives to it. So let's welcome each other. Choir will join the congregation. We'll come out and sing again in just a minute. Right now we want to take just a moment to welcome you to the service at Somerville Baptist Church. As we're singing the hymns, as we're going through the worship time, which leads ultimately to worshiping Him through the receiving of the Word, we want to make sure that you that are watching by live stream know that you're an integral part of what's happening today. So we want to encourage you to have your Bible ready, be praying about what God's trying to say to you, and be looking for God to speak to you. We value you watching it by live stream, but I will tell you, it'll never be a replacement for you coming and being a part of our service for real. So we want to invite you to come and find a time to say, I'm going to be a guest at Somerville Baptist Church. But in the meantime, right now while you're watching, we want to welcome you. We want to say it's our privilege to have you being a part of the Somerville family today. So let's listen to what God's going to say to us right now. Oh, my God. 
tomorrow brings. We're going to learn a newer song tonight, not new as in writing, but for our younger generation. Many of you may not know this, written by Squire Parsons, but he wrote this talking about when he looked back at the cross and he looked back at the grace of Jesus Christ, he stood amazed. Somebody once asked Gypsy Smith, in his old age, why he still got so worked up in his preaching, why he got so excited in his preaching, and he said, I've never lost the wonder of it all. And that ought to be the story of us as we look back at the cross of Jesus Christ, that we stand amazed at the grace that saved us. So let's sing this. If it's new to you, you'll learn it as we sing it together. supposed to come up then? Okay. Whew. I was scared. My wife was giving me a look and I just want to make sure. But it was a, it was a look of flirting. So <clears throat> I'll be over there soon, honey. Um, tonight we want to take a few moments. I remember as a child, my aunt and uncle, they were very much involved in music in the Tuscaloosa area. And I remember they had a, an old cassette tape. How many of us in here remember what, you know what a cassette tape is? You know. It was a Squire Parsons, that's a song that he wrote. And I can remember as a child listening to that song. Still, today it's even more amazing than it was back then. When you completely comprehend your sin, the gravity of it, and what Jesus Christ did for you. And where he came from, who he is. And the price he was willing to pay. Hope I never get over the amazement of salvation. Tonight, who would like to share with us word of testimony God's been working in your life, word of praise, or something God's done, and you want to tell, tell others about it? It's a great time for us as a church body. Who would like to share with us tonight? I'm just thankful for life. Uh, this week, Lori and I both celebrated our birthdays, and I was just thinking late last night, how that truly each day is a gift from God, and we have the opportunity to influence others. And I'm just thankful that he's blessed both of us with this many years and look forward to what he's going to do in and through us in the future. Amen. Amen. Somebody else tonight? Surely God did not just work through Anthony Beckham's life this past week. Brother Don? I'll be brief. I, I just wanted to 
celebrate my 59th birthday in the faith in the Lord. Hallelujah, and what a Savior. Brother Shane, I wanted to say thank you to my children. Um, they're fixing to move up next week, and I've already gotten so attached, I don't want to let them go. But I want to thank the parents of the children of our Sunday school class for raising such beautiful, wonderful children. I've not had an ounce of trouble with any of them all week, and I never thought I'd teach Sunday school class. But I'm so glad God put that one there for me because they, they bring me so much joy. They bring me out of my comfort zone. I never thought I was good with kids, but I find that I'm getting a little bit better with them. But I want to say the ones that are moving up, I love you so much. And I won't, and it's not like we're going away. But I won't see you on a weekly basis. And I just want to let you know that, Gary, and I love you very much. I don't know if I have a child in your class, Teresa. I don't think I do. But I sure wish I had if I don't. You had Reagan one time. That's when you were still practicing, trying to be good. Then. I understand. We're still trying to. Boy, what a great thing to see your Sunday school teachers loving their children like that. I can still remember most of my Sunday school teachers. They don't forget that. Thank you. Someone else tonight? Well, we have had a horrible month and a half. And you say, well, how can you get up and praise God over that? But he's been there every step of the way with us. He's prepared our hearts for every situation that's came up. And um, he's really teaching me because I'm the person when I get bad news, I go worst case scenario or I play the what if game because I'm like, if I get it worked out in my mind, then I'm going to be okay. But in doing that, I'm not giving God a chance to take care of our problems. So I'm really learning to live in the grace that God gives me day by day. And he's really shown himself to me in that last month and a half and really given me the grace to handle each day as it comes and each problem as it comes. So even though we're in a valley right now, God's still there. And he's no matter what the outcome is, God's still going to be God. And he's still been so good to us and so faithful to us. And I just cannot imagine my life without God in it. Because in the good times and the bad times, he's, he's still there. And, and I just want to give him praise and just thank him tonight. The song we sung this morning, we were, remember the works of your hands. When I was singing that song, I was thinking about all the other things God brought us through. And how he's going to bring us through this no matter what. So I just want to give praise to God tonight. Amen. I love watching Holly Myers sing. She's not worried about you old crusty one. She just sings to the Lord. Although I have to say, last week, you know, we had Bob Holmes, you started kind of dancing up here, Holly, and then I saw you catch yourself halfway through the song. I watched that whole progression. That's all right, McCall had a problem with David too. God was on David's side. Someone else tonight? Word of praise, testimony? Kind of the same, uh, along the same lines that Holly was saying, sometimes it's hard just to give it up to God and let him take control of the situation. Uh, the last few weeks at work, now that I'm a security guard, I never, I've always had a job where I'm guaranteed a job. I can walk in every day and I know I have a job, but in the security business, it's different. We can lose our contract for any given reasons. And uh, about two weeks ago, our district manager came down and he was down there just about every day of the week. And that's not really a good thing. So um, I kept asking around, like, hey, what's going on? Nobody wanted to tell me. No one would say anything. So I thought, well, great. We're just going to lose our job. I'm not, I don't, what am I going to do? I'm starting school again. Like, I've got to have a job. And uh, the Lord just, I finally, uh, my mom, especially with my mom being back, it's just so helpful for her to help remind me, like, just, just let the Lord take care of it. And it ended up being that um, my boss got a promotion and now he's going to be the area manager, and our contract's perfectly fine. They re-signed it, um, and I was actually given praise 
uh, to my shift that, um, you know, they really like us and what we're doing. So it's just kind of nice to be able to uh, just realize, just can give it up. It's, it's little stuff that we try to take control of. Amen. I appreciate Roland. This week I was asking Greg, I said I haven't seen Roland tell me, and that's just uh, from what happens a lot of times. Used to in the old auditorium, you sat up on the stage the whole time and you were just able to see where everybody sat in their normal seats and you could nail it down and you kind of mentally checked off. In this setting, you can't do that. And so there's just people that come to my mind, I haven't seen them. And he starts describing, he's listing all the different ways that Roland Burris is involved at Somerville Baptist Church. And this is the reason you don't see him is because he's behind the scenes working. And so I want to say thank you, Roland. Thank you for being a great blessing. Why are you all staring at me tonight? Last Sunday night was so good, and now you just look at me. Steve Chisgar has a testimony. He's right over there. I just saw him. I just saw him trying to duck behind my dad's head. Wow. Yep. Got called out. <laughs> no, uh, I, I just want to uh, thank the Lord for um, all he's doing in my life, for my family, and uh, for this church. It's been a great blessing to our family all these years, and, uh, and for you, Pastor. You know, uh, Teresa, uh, with Steve Chisgar, Steve was very instrumental in my two older sons' lives. One of the things they always bring up when we're talking about at Christmas time, we always share a praise and then a prayer request before they open a gift, and then we'll stop and pray and thank God for the praise and then pray for the prayer request. And almost without fail every year, Steve Chisgar's name will come up as one of the son's Sunday school teacher and how God used him in those days. And so I want to say thank you that the Chisgars have been faithfully at that for a long time. And God is using them. Pastor, I want to just say uh, Wednesday night I asked for prayer for my daughter-in-law. Um, she just had the baby and she was having some difficulties, blood pressure thing. But uh, I just wanted to say praise the Lord that she's gotten better, a lot better, made a big turnaround, big improvement. And uh, so I just praise the Lord for that. Amen. And today is 34 years for Eddie and Kim Lesson. Our hearts go out to you, Kim. Hey, Brother Allen. Um, I just want to say how much, um, you know, this church, the entire body is our friend. And I, I appreciate I appreciate all the prayers we've had. In the last couple of weeks, we, we, we've not only failed them, but we saw them happen. But I thought the last couple of weeks have been pretty, uh, pretty much a whirlwind, but nothing compared to uh, the last three days, I think it's been. Friday, we loaded up 11 of us in a van, piled up, I should say. And that was Friday evening around 3.30, almost 4 o'clock, we hit the road. We get to our destination in West Virginia. We got there 4 in the morning, I believe it was, and um, got a little bit of sleep, and then that day was the funeral, and we had to get there early for it, and um, we had the blessing and the opportunity to sing again as a family, Dean's brother and sister-in-law, and, and Dean, and believe it or not, myself, and um, then we... Um, that night, or the next morning, we get up again at 4 in the morning, 3 o'clock here, 4 in the morning, and we head back home and get here about 2.30, 3 o'clock, a few hours ago. So uh, we're kind of operating on adrenaline right now, but the um, big blessing was the funeral itself, and um, we just really felt the, the Holy Ghost there. But um, the, the, the gospel was clearly presented and we know for a fact there are several members there that were lost. And we were really praying, and the, the, I know our Sunday school class and the church have been praying for a particular person, Dean's oldest brother. And uh, several times I kind of leaned over and watched, and uh, you know, he was leaning forward and eyes on the, um, her other brother's pastor, and you could clearly see he was listening. And later on he even told me, he said, you know, I really, I really like that pastor but um 
what was a really a neat, tiny Adine's mother, she was, she could make quilts, I mean beautiful quilts, and she'd been making them most of her life, and it's been passed on from the family, you know, her, uh, her mother and her grandmother also made them, but anyhow, they had it on display, uh, I think about five or six of her best pieces up there by the casket, and um, also up there was a, a, a board, an empty board, poster board, and um, several weeks ago in the house that was found a, a few boxes of pieces of quilt. Now, I know there's a name for it where they put them together and they save them and then later on when they have enough they make the quilt. Well, there, there was found a box of those pieces. So uh, a dean's uh, sister-in-law had put some uh, Velcro on them and on this poster board there was Velcro. And at the very end they had all the Bob and Tiny's children, the three of them come up along with all their family and grandchildren and some of them even had great grandchildren. They would take a piece of that quilt and put it up on the board and, uh, until, uh, until it was completely filled. I know I'm going to get this wrong so I'm going to have to ask my wife, Adine, what, there was a banner on the top and we flipped it down and what did the banner say? Tiny's wishes, uh, find your peace in Christ. And it was pieces, as in the pieces of quilt. But, um, it, was, it was really neat. But uh, again, I pray that those who heard the gospel again, that uh, the Holy Ghost uh, work on their hearts. Yeah. So, but again, appreciate everybody's prayers. Thank you. All right. Yeah, I pray for a dean the past few months. Her father and mother have gone home to the Lord, and we praise the Lord for the hope that's found in Jesus Christ. What a great testimony. Very much so. I love the uh, Dave Thompson song from several years ago, You Made Peace of the Pieces. When you were telling that deacon's meeting, that reminded me of that song. Sandra? I just count it a privilege to be a part of a church that has so many ministries that if you're here, there's somewhere you can serve. And I have been honored and greatly blessed to be able to serve in the Morgan County Jail and in the RU. And you share the Word of God and you see the Word of God and the Spirit of God go into a heart and you begin to see changed lives. And I have just been so blessed to get to be a part and that you let me be a part and I just know that there's nowhere that you can't serve in this church if you want to serve the Lord. There's a place for everyone, and I, I'm just proud to be a part of it. Thank you. One of my earliest memories of being a pastor at Somerville Baptist was uh, back in those days you would show up at the church, and it was me and me. And Angie would be here, I think, three days a week, three mornings a week, I think it was. And that I remember coming in on Saturday and thought, well, you know, I'll get ready. There won't be anybody at the church. You know? And that was one of the first Saturday. I think it was the first Saturday. And it was Sandra and Donna and Sarah, Tanny. They had all come together for a prayer meeting. And I, I remember listening to them pray and thinking, what a blessing it is to know that you have people like that. And it's never stopped. No matter who walks away from ministry. Sandra Borden is just one of those solid ones. Always going to be serving faithfully, quietly and faithfully. And I praise the Lord for her. I sure do. Krista? I have a lot to be thankful for, but one of the, one of the biggest blessings that is in my life visually is my son. And I just, I'm very thankful that God gave him to me, lent him to me. And um, today's been a big day for him. He, uh, he graduated up to the teen group in, um, for the morning, morning time and sitting over there with them. And I just, I'm very thankful for this church that there are so many godly people investing in him. 
and as a single mom, I really appreciate that. And um, I just want to thank God publicly for Rusty. Amen. Amen. Rusty, does that embarrass you for your mom to do that? Don't ever let that happen. You keep that answer. It's a great gift he's given you. Welcome to the youth group, by the way. We need some men. Look around you. Someone else tonight you want to pray? Tanya, right here. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank the church for giving me the chance to serve in the Iwana program, and I'm really excited to be able to do that. Thank you. Amen. Yeah, this morning we had quite a crew here with Morgan County Jail Ministry. Adam? I, uh, I've got a praise. I, my dad is unsaved, and talking to him a year ago, he was every bit against church, didn't understand it, didn't understand the purpose of it. And uh, over the last year, I've had a, I've been blessed with a few opportunities to share the gospel with him. And uh, just, I got, got off the phone with my mom right before church started, and it was their anniversary, and uh, it was his idea to go to the art museum and the creation thing. And uh, just hearing from her about how he was feeling sick and he missed a, they have a gospel message at the end, and he missed it. And he came, he came back and he took some pain pills, and, but he wanted to go back that night. And uh, he bought some stuff and he was just excited to tell everybody at work about it, and that's just not, it's not him. And you know, it's, you pray for him, and it's hard to not let that prayer just seem redundant after a while and then you know when it's it almost seems seems pointless I hate to say that it's not but when you start feeling like that and then you see God bless you you know and uh, it's a blessing to me just to see I can see him working in his life and and I don't know if he's noticing it yet but it's just it's awesome and I'm, I'm thankful for that Amen. what is your father's name Adam uh, Wayne Wayne uh, remember to play, pray for Wayne Scrimpshaw, if you would, in prayer. Pray that God will get a hold of his heart and show him the need of salvation. In just a moment, we'll be looking at someone else. We'll be looking at Jack. Ms. Fida? Please. For the last two or three years with me. God will show me something and I'll turn around and look and that prayer has been answered. Nobody knows till they go through all the things that I went through. But I still thank God for every day he gives me to be able to see, to walk with him. And I want everybody in this church to realize I'm up through the night praying for you. I want God to just do some God-sized things like Brother Shane says time and time again. I want to see some God-sized things. And I ask y'all to just keep praying for me. Amen. Invite, I thank you for your faithfulness and being a prayer warrior. I mean that. Anyone else tonight before we go? Um, I just want to, she said that about we will remember, and I was thinking about that today as well. And, and then I was sitting by Ms. Vicky, and then um, you said that about Brother Steve, and I looked down the row. Well, actually, the whole row pretty much played a huge part in my life. And um, I'll never forget Ms. Vicky because of... Um, I'd always go to the library after Sunday night service. She'd give me a lollipop. And then she was always in charge of doing the Christmas program for the kids. And she poured so much into each one of, of us. And uh, lots of the, Jacob knows how much time she spent with us on Sundays, hours of her time. 
And, uh, and she wouldn't just teach us to play and make sure we're learning it, but she'd sit down and talk to us what it means and what we're actually trying to do. And then Brother Steve, and I'll never forget his Sunday school classes, and they were so much fun. And we learned so much, and um, just about becoming men as well, and just, uh, just learning that part of life and how to speak to people, how, just the simple things that we're going to need, and also learning about Christ. And he was a perfect example. And then Mr. Dean, and she was my uh, first grade teacher, and I'm, you left the year after... Yeah, you came here. To, yeah, I drove you out. Um, and so I'll never forget whenever he we He thinks would, he's cracking a joke, doesn't he? <laughs> and so uh, I, would, I, was, I had struggles uh, through kindergarten through first grade. And we were, I was about to get held back just because of some things I was struggling with. But I got to Mr. Dean, and she spent hours with me. I'll never forget. I'd always have trouble getting free time because I'd always be covered up with work because I'd get so behind. Well, there was one day, one day I actually got done on time. And I told Mrs. Dean, I said, I'm done, I'm done. Can I go to free time? She goes, yeah, you have free time. Go back there with Drew Clemens, and he's going to teach you how to tie your shoes. <laughs> I was in first grade. I didn't know how to tie my shoes. So I, 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 I was a slow learner. But um, I just, no, I remember her classes, though, and I see her working in the preschool, and she pours her heart and, and she pours her life into these kids. And same thing with Brother Allen. We got to go to Arab Elementary every day, every week this summer, twice a week, to speak to kids. And they thought so much of um, the Matthews, and the kids here think so much of Miss Dean. And uh, I just thank God for the people. Everybody in this room has poured into my life, and I love this church. And um, I just always want to remember um, what God's done here and what He's done in my life, and but changed lives here. And I love him, and I love my father, and I love my mother, and I love this church with all my heart. So thank you for everything you've done for me. Someone else? Everybody's looking at me trying to see if I'm going to cry or not. <laughs> How many of you make plans to look at the solar eclipse tomorrow? How about that? How about that? I got in trouble this afternoon, Branda Bloodworth, <clears throat> for uh, posting Nick Saban's response to those. They even called me, <laughs> they even used a name. That's why I'm crying now. Somebody called me a name and <clears throat> told me that I needed to obey the golden rule. They called me a name while they did it, which was kind of ironic to me, but, you know, nonetheless. <clears throat> Somebody else have a word? I, if you want to see the solar eclipse, knock yourself out. I think it is a neat thing. I really do. I'm not busting on it, so please don't send me messages. I'm not busting on it. Danielle. The video that Shelly posted of Todd um, teaching Peyton about um, tithing. That was just so encouraging to see. He's only been saved for a short time now, but already just passing that on to his son. And I don't know, it just, it, it just very encouraging. I hope that doesn't embarrass you, but thank you for sharing, Shelly. That was an encouragement. Well, in case it does embarrass you. I think I have about half a church that needs to see that illustration. So I'll be using that. <laughs> Anybody else tonight? What a privilege it is to be a part of Somerville Baptist. It really is. And it is a family. It's a church family. And I think that's very important. And we wondered when we came to the auditorium in this auditorium. It was a different setting. It took a while to get comfortable with it. Some parts you're never quite comfortable with compared to you know being in a smaller room. But I will tell you, I praise the Lord that we're still a church family. And I thank God for that. Anyone else tonight? Victoria? I know we're pretty far out from this, um, but I'm just still dwelling on the blessings that we got from the ladies enrichment retreat um, a couple of weeks ago 
But I just wanted to say how thankful I am for our pastor's wife. And um, I was reading over her session notes even today and how much of an encouragement it was to me. Her session was on um, living in a glass ship. It was geared towards women in ministry. And I can't say how much of an encouragement it was to me um, just because I'm less than a year out from becoming a pastor's wife. And going into it, I was kind of expecting just some tips on, you know, how it is living in a glass ship, how to combat, how to live, you know, things like that. But she just gave such sound advice that was simple and practical for someone like me who's going to be going into ministry very soon. Um, Her advice was just to be yourself and love the people. And that has stuck with me for weeks, and it will probably stick with me for the rest of my life, you know, going through um, life as a pastor's wife. And I'm just very thankful for her and her ministry to me and being an encouragement to me. And I just... I love her, and I love our church, and I love being here. Um, Just to reiterate what everybody else has said, um, it's a great place to be, and I just love y'all. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, she was getting ready for that, Victoria, and she asked, she was throwing some things at me, and she said this statement, she goes, I'm not not pulling any punches here. I want want them to know that, that this is a good thing. I don't want it to be this some pity party we all come together in and we're crying about being in ministry. And she made that, she actually made that statement Friday. I don't know if you remember making that statement to me. But she, uh, that's really the key. We're not sacrificing to be in ministry. I mean, it's, it, it is a great life. And I praise the Lord for how he's called us, enabled us, and placed us in Somerville Baptist Church. Do not feel sorry for me. Do not cut my pay, but do not feel sorry for me. <laughs> Jordan? Um, it, it is an encouragement always just to come back. I know that I've uh, just been at college for the past three years, um, about to go into my last year, and, you know, just between the breaks, being off uh, sometimes just across the country and things like that, but it's always just encouraging to come back and be here and be at this church, and um, I, it's an encouragement just to see how the people are trying to reach others in their workplace and the community. I, um, I, while I, while I've been back here for the past two weeks, just um, since I've been back from Vermont, uh, I've been working at uh, the CGR um, plant where. Um, Mr. Shaney Fell is the uh, manager there, and, and Tyler works there, and uh, Jarrett worked there for a little bit, and um, just to just to be there, and, and you know, there's a lot of new faces, and so um, I remember seeing w- one guy uh, who was pretty built, and so I was talking to this guy, and he, he was a running back for Mississippi State, and uh, and so I was talking to this guy a little bit, and just trying to get to hear his story. Really sad how um, he. He, he got married, had two little babies, and his wife, uh, you know, got sick and passed away. And so I thought, man, I really need to invite this guy to church. And, and I thought, man, what better than Tailgate Sunday? And so I was talking to Tyler and um, Tyler Shaney Felt and Mr. Shaney Felt, and they said, oh, well, we've already invited him. And, and so I was like, okay. So I, I just went on ahead and invited him, too. And then I saw another guy um, who, who was new, and, and I thought, well, uh, I, I said, what's the story on this guy? I'm thinking about inviting him to church, and they're like, oh, we've already invited him, he's, and he's visited. I'm thinking, I remember we made the joke, I, I, was, I was saying, well, good night, you know, like, <laughs> can you leave somebody for me to invite to church? But it really is, it, it is a very huge encouragement uh, just to see how um, the people are reaching out, even in their workplace, in the community, and just reaching others around them and, and to see lives, lives change and lives affected. And, and, it's, and it's a gigantic blessing just to be at my home church. And, um, and so thank you. And, and if I could be an encouragement to Somerville Baptist by just saying, let's continue to do that. Let's continue reaching others in our, in our workplaces and in our schools and uh, in our community as well. Amen. Amen. Sue? I would just like to say how thankful I am for the 
continued discipleship program here. And for my discipler, Ms. Joyce Wright, we finished up. And um, I have a forever long friend now. And I was so hungry to continue, you know, learning about after salvation and you lead someone to the Lord and bring them to church. And then what? For years I thought that. And was just couldn't wait to get into this when I saw that we had it here. And I'm so thankful to the Lord that he has allowed us to come together. And I have a forever friend now, too. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of discipleship. You not only learn how to walk with Christ, but you have someone to walk with as you walk with Christ. I encourage you, if you've not gone through discipleship, then I encourage you to do that. If you haven't gone through discipleship, then we have plenty of opportunities right now for you to be involved in discipling somebody else. And Joyce, she was a pastor's wife for 58 years. Is that right, Joyce? 60. I apologize. 60 years. The Lord used her, Brother Jimmy, in a great way. She has guests with her tonight. She was talking to me last night, the West. She was talking to me last night about... Uh, it's a very special prayer request on the phone. We were praying together. So, what a great blessing. Great blessing. All right. You have no, I was just about to make a smart comment about you, Stick. I almost, I was just about to say, I have let you alone for this one. And here you are. There are no smart comments to make about me. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I had to apologize to you for this morning when you said that you were a serial killer. I saw you with a big bowl with a whole box of cereal in it just chowing down. <laughs> so let me be clear about this, right? Bite size. Frosted mini wheats, original flavor. <laughs> Not the big stuff that gets soggy. Bite size. Original, no off-brand. <laughs> I expect that now, stick, in the middle of a service, talking about me. Now go right ahead, please. Friday night, downtown Decatur, they have third Friday for the car show. My daughter says something about going down. Went down there, saw a lot of people that I've known from the past. Uh, a lot of them had a strong smell of alcohol on them, talking about uh, you know, things of old. You know, it just uh, made me realize how lost all these people are and uh, how blessed I am but God and how he's changed my life and how he's using me now and I feel so privileged to be used by God and when actually down there ran into a couple of people that knew about Somerville Baptist Church and uh, everybody always has praise for Somerville Baptist and when I talk about it you know, what's up what makes us different than most is we are a church of doers and not hearers only. And uh, that's what it's all about. And uh, I'm so, so happy to be a part of, of this church because uh, God is doing great things here. Amen. Love you all. Amen. Let's do breakfast together tomorrow, Stick. Eating? I tried to put it off because I'm um, Jackson and I have a lot in common with uh, Defendant Composed, but I am so thankful for this youth group and um, how they serve here at this church and how they invest in people's lives. And God has blessed us richly, and um, especially for the three that are about to go. Um, the way they've poured into my family's lives, my young ones, my spouse, myself. Um, to God be the glory for everything they've done here at Somerville Baptist. And I just want them to know that we're um, covering them in prayer. And I can't wait to see what God's going to do in their life.
Josh. I just want to thank the Lord for his grace and his faithfulness. Um, this month, one thing that Facebook is good for is it brings reminders, and it's reminders of God's faithfulness. And just looking this month, of course, Todd, which we've talked about in God's answered prayer there and seeing that. But also on a reminder this month came Jeff Hudgens' picture that one year ago he had trusted Christ as a Savior in your office, and that picture came up this month. And as you look around the auditorium, you just see pictures of grace everywhere you turn and that God is faithful to answer prayer. Also this month it popped up. Uh, four years ago, God brought our family to Somerville Baptist, and just what a huge change he's made in our life and in our family, and this week we're going to take Jordan to college, and I'm not letting myself be sad about it, although my flesh wants to be, but just to see God's work in her life, uh, it's exciting, and um, how can you whine and cry when God is blessing and his hand is upon you in such a great way? And so I praise the Lord for her. And then this week, Kim and I celebrate 19 years of marriage. And so I look around at just God's grace and his faithfulness. And this month especially, it's just come up time and time again, just reminders of what a great and faithful and gracious God we have. Amen. Amen. Col Colton, can I do Salita first? Please. Thank you. I've been trying to put it off because I got my four-year-old in here tonight. She's got to go potty. And um, everybody's been historical and emotional, and I've been here since 1999. And um, just seeing the transition of the church and so many people I've grown up with, and I knew Christian when he was itty-bitty and charity. And, um, and now Jordan has joined the group, and they're going off, and I'm trying not to be emotional. They're not my children, but they are just wonderful people in my life that have been a blessing to me and um, I just want to say I, I'm thankful for each person in here that I've been coming to contact with there's so many different levels of friendships that I have in here I've, every one of us have gone through trials and every time I put a Facebook post that I'm so encouraged to be back in the Lord's home um, I'm so encouraged I'm trying not to cry, and, you know, Chris is my big buddy that I just love her, and I've got so many buddies around here that um, I'm thankful for. So my voice is already breaking, and um, I just thank you for your many prayers that you made on my family and all the people in this church. You've shown tremendous love toward each other and towards the community, and I'm just grateful for each one of you and pastor. Thank you for being our pastor. And uh, thank you for dedicating all five of my children. And um, I'm very thankful for this church, and I hope that I never have to leave. Um, this week, uh, last week, I had a very huge blessing. Um, I moved in with my mom, and I changed schools. And it's just hard to believe that I've grown up this fast. I'm hearing my family talking about it, but... It just doesn't seem like it's already here. And um, I love everything at Hartsville, but the main thing is this church. It's been with me the whole time. Amen. I just want to say thank you to all the preschool workers for being so welcoming to me this summer. Um, this past July during mission trip, I got to start working with them, and... I just want to say thank you for being such an encouragement to me, and I cannot wait till next summer to come back and work with you. And we'll be sure to keep your name on file. <laughs> Kenzie did a great job and has a mean serve in volleyball, too, I might add. Jacqueline. I've been trying not to share this. <laughs> um, so mine's kind of on a different note, but I just wanted to share how God answers prayers. Um, Last week, or a couple weeks ago, I started back at work, um, and I've had not really issues with my boss, but there's just, I feel like I've been treated poorly, and um, I've been letting it kind of harbor inside of me, um, feeling new feelings that I haven't felt before, just holding bitterness against her, and um, a lot of different negative feelings, <laughs> and um, my friend came and stayed with me back home, 
uh, last week, and she was going through the same thing, and we were up till probably one in the morning just praying about it, and this week I have seen tremendous results, and it's not that anything has really changed necessarily, but I think God's changed my heart, um, and he's also, I definitely see, like, not that she's kinder to me, but I feel his presence there, and I'm able to serve him instead of trying to please man, and that's made all the difference in the world, and I talked to my friend who had the same situation. She said the exact same thing, that she's seen um, such crazy results since we prayed about it, and so I'd ask you guys for prayer for that as well, but I just wanted to share how God um, specifically answered our prayer in such a, a quickly, a quick fashion as well, so. I love all the young people that go away, but I love all the young adults that are here at Somerville Baptist. You're a great blessing. You're vital to our ministry. Speaking of, I just want to thank this church. You are a young adult, right? Am I right? Close. Close. <laughs> I just want to thank this church for like what a blessing it is. Um, I mean, it, I know it's been said so many times, but it really is a church family. Like, I am so excited every week. Everybody's like, it's Saturday, and I'm always like, it's Sunday, yes, and I'm always so excited to get to come to church, and, like, it's such a blessing to get to share that with even the people I work with, um, like, they're like, why are you so excited about Sunday? I'm like, I don't know, but you should come to church with me, because I have the best church ever, and it's just, they, like, they see that, and they respond, they're like, well, maybe I should come, I'm like, it's a long drive, but it's worth it, and um, I just want to thank everybody that makes it that enjoyable, and makes it not, there's so many people that think of serving as, like, a burden, and there's so many people here that are like so excited to serve God, and that just spreads. It's like so contagious. And I just want to thank all the leadership of this church that make it that way. Um, they have instilled in me the love to serve, and that's something I could never be more thankful for. So I just want to thank this church and for that. We're glad you're here, Nellie. Very much so. Jordan? Well, I don't know if I can do this without crying, but I might pull a Jackson as well, but um, <laughs> I'm just very, very thankful. <clears throat> if you don't know, this is my last church service um, before I go off to college, and I'm just overwhelmed with thankfulness, and as I stood this morning and just watched, you know, everybody singing and praising the Lord and there's nothing like that, and I will miss it so much, but I have always told people um, that what made this place home for me was the church, and it's so true. When we first moved here, I was just starting my ninth grade year, and everybody is, was just so loving and so welcoming, and when peop new people come and they talk about it, I know exactly what they feel because that's exactly what this church did for my family when we came, and and it hasn't ever stopped. That's the awesome part. It's just anytime we're in need, anytime my brother's health is bad, anytime anything's going on, you know, there's people on our doorstep with food or, you know, whatever it is. There's just always people ministering. And it's been such an encouragement and a blessing and a true learning experience um, for me to be here. And I'm just very thankful um, to God for bringing us here. And I'm thankful to Pastor for what he's meant in my life, and I'm um, also very thankful for my parents, and I'm excited to start this new chapter, but I'm also a little sad um, to say goodbye, or see you later, as we like to say, but um, I just wanted to say how overwhelmingly thankful I am for each of you, and uh, what you've meant to me, and um, the example that you've been in my life. Are you leaving too? <laughs> <laughs> this happened about a month ago. We were in Kid Zone, and a friend from my football team, he came to church here, and I got to go back with him. And um, His name's Braxton, by the way. And I got to lead him to the Lord, and 
I got to witness to him about the Lord. Um, I practiced a little bit more so he can get a little bit more about details about Jesus and his healings. And he's he said that he's coming to the church in a, a couple weeks. So if y'all would just pray for him that he will be committed to keep coming to church and learn more about God. Amen. Amen. Jarrett, would you come and sing for us tonight before we go to the Word? Take your Bibles and turn, please, to Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. Be in prayer, if you would, for Vanessa Neesmith. Vanessa's Neesmith family, Jimmy, Vanessa, Justin, have been very faithful members of Somerville Baptist Church for many, many years. And uh, she has gone through a trying summer with a hip replacement that did not work. And uh, in the middle of all that, the surgeon passed away. Now, tomorrow morning, she'll be having a more extensive uh, surgery that will be taking place. And so, please be in prayer. It's a complete redo plus some further procedures from damage that has been done. 
So please lift her up in prayer at Huntsville Hospital. Also be in prayer for Evelyn Motes, and that is the mother of Javon and Roxanne. Javon Aldridge, Roxanne Tucker, uh, she fell this past weekend, and she has um, issues with brittle bones, and so when the break happens, it's not typically just a normal break, so it was, it was quite a break, and she had surgery yesterday, and they didn't get all accomplished that they wanted to, but uh, she's now healing, and I'm sure there's probably going to have to be more procedures done, Javon, I would assume, in time, and so lift up, if you would, Evelyn Motes, she's down in Coleman Hospital tonight. <clears throat> Several years ago, in between um, Michigan and Alabama, I went back home to where I went to high school in Texas. The pastor had had a heart attack, my pastor, still my pastor, and uh, they thought they were in the middle of transition. When you go back to where you're from, people tend to only remember you how you were, and so there's a lot of things there that I regret from my high school years. Uh, there's a lot of things that the Lord did in my own life during that time. But you find that uh, friends that were friends back then, it's easy to make, to uh, kind of reignite those friendships. And one of those was a family. I'm not going to give you the full name. But it was a family that really took me in. They were very kind to me in my high school years. We'd hang out at their house quite a bit. And yet, uh, it was a uh, man that for years had been in ministry. And... He had stepped out of ministry, and it really wasn't an event that caused him to step out of ministry. It was a process uh, to the place that I can remember now that I've come back. And uh, he sat me down. We were sitting in my office, and he goes, Shane, I just want to tell you something. The Lord had been using him over the past few years. He had rededicated his life to Christ, and God was using him in a great way. And... He sat down and he said, Shane, the last time you knew me, I was in a very carnal place. And you may not have known all the story. I didn't. But he began to tell the story. And as he began to tell the story, when he came to the end of it, he was crying. Several of the children had felt the effects of his story, his own children, and had struggled. uh, Some to the point of just leaving church altogether. And uh, he was brokenhearted over it. And his statement to me at the end of all of that, which took about close to an hour, he said, Shane, whatever it is that you're holding secretly in your heart, let it go. Because it's that one issue that will get you. I still to this day don't know exactly what he was referring to, but I do remember that statement. In Joshua chapter 7, you find a man who had a secret sin, at least he thought it was secret, and you see immediately, in his case, the effects. But I will tell you, for not just him, but anyone, it's consistent, the effects of secret sin. It's things that we don't think anybody sees. It's kind of the old adage in our society now that if it's done in private, then it's no one else's business. And for the believer in Jesus Christ, that's not true. Now we understand, and by the end of this, I want you to know that Jesus Christ died on the cross to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from unrighteousness. But it is a process for us, though we are forgiven of the eternal consequences of our sin, the natural consequences of our sin, he does not eliminate from us while we're living here on this earth. And so it's very important, even knowing Christ as Savior, it's very important to understand that what we think, Christ said in the book of Luke, that what we do in secret will be made open. He's given us that. And that's not just God's condemnation. That's the natural ebb and flow of consequences, of actions and reactions. It's just the ebb and flow of life. So it's very important. I don't know why God led me to preach this message, but I have to believe that there are some in this Sunday night service that there are some things going on privately in our life that it is just about to get us. We don't even see it. We don't even realize it. That we are playing with a snake that's just about to turn on us now. And so I want to give you a challenge tonight, an encouragement that we can, through His grace, have victory. But I want to challenge you to consider the ripple effects of sin. Joshua chapter 7, look if you will at verse 1. 
The children of Israel have just defeated. The walls of Jericho have fell upon themselves. It was an act of God. Literally, it's like his hand came down on the city. They did not fall outward. The scripture says they fell inward. The people in Jericho, you remember Rahab and her family were the ones spared. It was a miracle what had happened. And it was also an incredible victory. So the nation of Israel's crossed the Jordan River. This is a huge event. This is the first fruits. You need to remember this by the command that he's given them. This is the first fruits of victory that he's giving them. This is how the Lord views it. As a result of this, the Lord was very clear that everything about this particular victory was to go completely to God. There was to be nothing left that was held onto. There was to be no spoils. Typically, when, when the men went to battle and they fought, they were able to bring spoils back. So if they found silver and gold, they could keep it to themselves. In this case, when they, when they defeated this the city of Jericho, God said, no, no, this is your first great victory. I wanted it to be clear that this was for me and that this victory was mine and this is representative of what's going to be happening now across the entire promised land that I've given you. So let me be very clear. There is nothing held for yourself. It all belongs to me. That was right down to the, I mean, to the barest items. It was a very strong symbolism he was trying to put in place. That's what brings us to Joshua 7 and verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing. In other words, he hid gold, he hid, hid um, raiment, he hid some robes in the floor. We find out in the, in the ground underneath his tent is actually where he hid them. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Get this. Don't miss. You're talking about an individual. And then you see the plural and the singular mixed in. There's a point to that. Verse 2. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Haven on the east side of Bethel, about 20 miles from Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And Ai was just a little spot. In the, it was Somerville compared to a Huntsville, Decatur. It was just a spot in the road. Just a little village is what it was. How much so? Verse 3. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. So there went up thither of the people about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. You're talking of only a few hundred men that Ai had, not trained warriors. They were just village dwellers. You had these men coming in. As they came in, they literally put the nation of Israel on the run. Right at the very beginning of the conquest of the land of Canaan. And verse 5 gives some of the results. And the men of Ai smote of them about 30 and 6 men. For they chased them before the, from before the gate which was at Shebarim, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore... The hearts of the people melted and became as water. It wasn't just the hearts of the people. Look at verse 6. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon the, his face before the ark of the Lord, even or until the eventide, he and the elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, All as, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side, Jordan. This is not the children of Israel saying this. This is Joshua himself who stood at the side of Moses for decades. This was devastating to the nation of Israel. Absolutely devastating. And they had no idea why. Except one. And the one was Achan himself. So tonight, just a few minutes now, I'd like us to kind of calculate the cost that secret sins exact. Number one, see this. There's only three points. Number one, we need to understand that the cost of secret sin is always shared by others. The cost of secret sin is always shared by others. Sin is that that happens when we disobey God. His commandments are very clear. After salvation... 
We have the, the power through his Holy Spirit, his grace to have victory over sin, but the old man still battles. Colossians 3 goes through this whole scenario, put off, put on. Romans chapter 6 talks about the battle that's still taking place. So the effect of sin is something that we still have to be concerned with because the presence of sin is still here. But let's be very clear about this. In case you're here tonight and saying, well, you know what, it's just... It's my own secret sin. It's what I do in private. Nobody sees it. Nobody knows about it. Nobody knows the heart of bitterness. Nobody knows the things that I see. Nobody knows, perhaps even they've not caught on the lies that I tell. The effect of sin never, listen, this is, this is a maxim to remember. The effects of sin never stop with you. It's never just about you. And that's very important for us to remember tonight. Joshua 7, even the connections made, you see, but the children of Israel, it says at the beginning, it's plural, but then it comes right back to the singular for Achan. Well, Achan did it, but then at the end of the verse, it comes right back to the plural that the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Why is he viewing it this way? Because he gave the command. And as a result of the command, the one is part of the many. Well, pastor, that's... I don't don't see how that's really fair. I don't see how that's really... I will tell you this, whether you agree or disagree with the fairness of it, it's a natural outflow of what sin does in our lives. Think about how connections even work in our world where we're living right now. Someone in the Middle East, they attack Israel. Someone in the Middle East, they commit an act of terrorism. Not only affects his own people, it affects the rest of the world now. What's going on in North Korea can affect the rest of the world in just a few moments. You have a parent. They're angry all the time. They're bitter all the time. They're selfish, dishonest. How much is that going to cost him and his children, both in the present and in the future? It's not just going to affect you. It's not just going to affect what's going on in your life. It's going to affect your husband's life. It's going to affect your wife's life. The children, I can tell you, Rhonda Johnson can tell you how many times we sit down with people in counseling sessions. Josh can tell you how many times we sit down with people speaking of what took place. Oh, well, they're just playing the victim card. You know, there's nobody in this auditorium that is more impatient with our victim culture than I am. Anyone that knows me understands that. But I want also to understand coming from the mouth of an impatient man When you're sitting down in that office, you see the effects of what happens in a home that is living with a person who thinks that their sin is being kept secret, that it's never getting out of those doors. Child insists on being immoral. How much is that going to cost the parents? The shame, the humiliation, and time, perhaps even other effects from that. If an employee is dishonest, how much it will cost his company, his fellow workers, his family. It's very important for us to understand that the cost of secret sin will always be shared by others. John Donne, a great classic writer from, from years ago, wrote this. He said, quote, No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of a continent, a part of the main. Everything about your life is connected with those around you. And so sins that we think are kept secret, they're kept hidden, they are affecting and they will affect. And the longer that sin festers, it's going to affect in a greater way those that are connected with you. Sin is always shared by others. There's a second truth from secret sin. Not only is the cost always shared by others, but I can guarantee you of this one, that the cost is always higher than you calculate it. It's always going to cost more. Verse 1 says, one man sinned, the Lord's anger burned against the Israelites. Down in verse 12, if you look down at verse 12, it says, therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were cursed. Neither will I be with you anymore, except you destroy the accursed from among you. So literally, these undefeated warriors, there were 686,000 Israelite warriors. They sent only three of the 686 to defeat this little village. And as a result, it turned these hundreds of thousands, including all of their leaders, it turned them into whimpering cowards. The 
The cost is always higher than what we calculate. You read verses 4 through 7, you start to count the cost of one man's sin. Achan, one man. What did it cost? It cost 36 other men's lives. They had no idea why they were dying. They had no plans of dying to them. They'd already seen the walls of Jericho fall on themselves. So they thought, well, my word, that's the city of Jericho. What? We'll just... We'll just breathe and Ai will fall over. They had no idea that they would not be coming home that night. They had, those children had no idea they were going to grow up without a dad. That wife had no idea that she had become a widow. 36 families were affected by this. The loss of a city that should have easily gained retreat when it should have been advanced. The nation had just come off this huge high of Jericho and now they are Fear and doubt has completely overtaken them. Even, even the leader Joshua himself now is questioning God. He's the leader himself. You're talking about Joshua who had watched the complaints, the murmuring, the, the issues with Moses. He had watched this for years. He'd been faithful for years. And in this one, it, it was just too much. He couldn't understand. Lord, you brought us all this way, and now you're letting us down. The effects even upon the leader of God's people that sin had. I can tell you this, Achan, if he was let in on this, you have to imagine that Achan would have never dreamed of taking that few things, the little bitty stuff from Jericho that he took, that would cost the lives of 36 men. He would never do that knowingly. He would never want to see the Israelites' hearts melt like water. It's the same phrase that Rahab uses in Joshua chapter 2 of the people of Jericho, that our hearts didn't melt within us when we heard that Jehovah God and his people were coming to be at war with us. Now it's the people of Jehovah God whose hearts are melting. It has completely demoralized an entire nation. And they don't even know why yet. The problem is, I'll tell you this tonight, for those of us who are playing this I think just a deadly game with sin. God <clears throat> does not let us get that kind of insight into the effects of sin except through passages that we read such as tonight. And I have to imagine why we're sitting here and we're listening to this and we're looking at this passage and being in prayer of what I was going to speak on and this has been something sitting here for at least three weeks now to preach from this passage. I think that God is sending a signal to myself, others, whatever it is, quit messing around with it. Whatever you think is being kept in secret, confess it, bring it to him tonight. Quit allowing this cancer to fester in your own heart and spirit because it is going to affect others. It's going to affect them greatly and it's gonna be a cost that's much, much higher than you could ever imagine and it's gonna happen in a moment and when it happens, it's gonna be that I can't believe, this, this is what I, this is what I thought would never happen, and it happened. And it's going to be much higher than you could have ever dreamed. Third and finally, when it comes to secret sin, the cost is always shared by others. The cost is always higher than you can calculate. And the cost always involves death. Verses 8 and 9. O oh Lord, what shall I say? When Israel turneth their backs from before their enemies... For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us around or surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will thou do unto thy, what will they, thou do unto thy great name? And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore liest thou upon thy face? Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them, for they have even taken of the accursed thing, have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. They've taken that which does not belong to them. And they've kept it secret. <clears throat> I don't think for a second that Achan had any idea that Jehovah God had any personal interest in him. Which, by the way, is how most of us rationalize away our sin. There's not been a single person that the cost of sin has ever caught up with that when you sit down and talk with them, that they will say, you'll catch it in their phraseology, you'll catch it how it comes out in conversation, 
the idea was, you know what, I really didn't think it was that big a deal, or I really didn't think I was that big a deal, or most generally, I thought that I was going to be the exception. I thought for all the other things that I'm doing, surely I'll be the exception. Do you know why it's called an exception? Because it normally doesn't happen. That's why it's called the exception. And you are playing this game on you being the exception, on me being the exception. Here's the problem with this. God, in this particular area, says that there are no exceptions. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And he even tells you the reaping process. You want to reap the wind? Then you, then you sow the wind, then you're going to reap a whirlwind. You want to sow a match, you're going to reap a forest fire. It's not like you didn't tell us. The process is set in motion now. In verses 19 and 20, you go to the end, and you see this drastic process. And Joshua, they found it was jo- or Achan. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him. They used this process of basically casting lots. They whittled it down until the Lord revealed that it was Achan. So now Joshua is speaking directly to him. And tell me now, at the end of verse 19, what thou hast done, hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, by the way, let me say this to you. Oh, you know what? I've covered my bases. They, they can't find this out. There's no way. I've deleted the history. I've done whatever it takes. You know, they're not going to find this. It's not an issue of them finding it out. It's an issue of God revealing it. Don't you understand? It's an issue of him revealing it. He always knew this was going on. And he can use a multitude of ways for that to be exposed. By the way, can I tell you something? The worst thing that can happen to you is for that sin to be able to be prolonged before it's brought out into the open. Because it will only grow and you'll only get more emboldened in your sin. Many times it's gracious of the Lord with his children to reveal the sin. Maybe the one thing that saves the home, saves the marriage, saves whatever else you hold valuable in life. Verse 20, And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And thus and thus have I done. So he confessed it, is really what it's saying. And then I want you to look at the process in verse 21, and we're almost finished. When I saw the first step is the look. Remember what we talked about in Matthew chapter 5 this morning. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment, and 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, what was the first part of the process that went wrong? He saw it. But let me tell you what the scene was. The scene was a lingering scene. So not only did he see it, now the next step, it's the issue of I coveted it. It wasn't mine to have, but I wanted something that wasn't mine. So I looked at it to the point, I fantasized about it to the point, I dreamed about it to the point that I wanted it. Now this is where many times we get struck. We don't realize it started with the scene, so this is how we defend it. You know what, I can cut this off at any time. I, I can turn it off at any time. I can stop saying those things at any time. I can, I can stop listening, I can stop watching, I can stop whatever it is. You think that you're fully in control of your flesh and spirit. I'll, let's be very clear about this. You're going to serve something. And that something is either going to be God or your flesh. But you're going to be enslaved to one or the other. Man, by creation, is not his own master. So it's either our sinful nature or it's our our relationship with Christ that's in control. We can't say no to our sin. Don't you understand? When you feed this, when you allow it to have control, it is in charge of you. You can no longer, you speak with young, with young people. Over and over, you know, Pastor, I know we were, we were just, all we were doing, we were just flirting around, and it just took another step, and then it took another step. And, and I just, I remember him saying it directly to me. He said, Pastor, I just thought, you know, when it was time, you could just stop it. You could just, but I couldn't. No, you can't. Why is it that you think you're going to be the one to do that? 
I'm not speaking to just young people. I'm speaking to all of us tonight. So he saw it, and then he coveted after it, and then he took it. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent. It's just, a, it's just an incredible description of the progression of sin. What's not listed there is what it's about to come after. Because I can tell you, the progression of sin also has at the end of this its reward. So Joshua sent messengers, verse 22, and ran into the tent. And behold, it was hid in his tent, the silver under it. And they took him out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua and unto all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters, his oxen, his asses, his sheep, his tent and all that he had. And they brought them unto the valley of Achor, which by the way, there's still the valley of Achor over in Israel today. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and turned and burned them with fire after they'd stoned them with stones. Can you imagine? I just want you to think about this scene. The scene of Achan's youngest child looking in the eyes of his father. What, Dad, is the price of my life? It's this Babylonian garment. It's this wedge of a rock. It's a little bit of money. And yet we make that calculated cost. Somehow in our mind we rationalize that it's worth it. Over and over and over again. It's never worth it. It's never worth it. Young people, listen to me. It's never worth it. You can ignore it. You can stay on your phone and try to bypass me, what I'm saying now. But I'm telling you, it's never worth it. And you've been told It's not just the fool in his heart that says there is no God. It's also the fool in his heart that says God's not gonna, God's not gonna enact. I'm the exception. I will say this, ultimately the death of Jesus Christ is the answer to this. He died for that sin, you come to him, he will forgive that sin. But when you study even the book of Proverbs, you'll find that many natural consequences of our sin will still play out. We're not underneath the condemnation, but on earth we're underneath still the consequences of that sin. They must still play out. Years ago, 2005, there was a commercial put out by Roche Pharmaceuticals and it was promoting a treatment by prescription for hepatitis C. And the ads featured a close-up of a man who looked like he had been in a fist fight. I don't know if anybody remembers this, but I mean his face was like a bludgeon. I mean... It was swollen up and beaten. And this is what they said at the end of the commercial, very powerful statement. And here's their quote. If hepatitis C attacked your face instead of your liver, you would probably do something about it. I still remember that from 12 years ago. I remember that commercial and how powerful that image was. If the effects of sin were immediately consequential on something visible, we would deal with it, we would handle it. But because it's not immediate and because it's not obvious, somehow we think that it's all right. But I'm speaking to myself, I'm speaking to everybody here tonight, and those that are watching, and those that are gonna be listening, and those that are gonna be listening to it on the radio, if they're sitting in their car, wherever it is, and right here and right now is where we are. It could be a gossiping tongue. It could be a lazy work ethic. It could be a pornographic mind. It could be a host of, you know what that is. You know what it is. It could be this issue of anger and bitterness that you still have those that you're called to love or those that you're called to serve. I don't know what your secret sin is. I don't, I don't know what it is. But I will tell you this, if you don't deal with this, there will be a time that it catches up. So tonight, give it to him. If you've never been forgiven of sin, then tonight come to Jesus Christ in salvation. That's why he died. 
He died to forgive you of your sin. But for those of us who are saved, understand also why he died. He died, and then he rose from the grave, as he says in the book of Romans, so that you and I might also walk in the newness of that life. And that is having victory over that sin. So surrender that to him tonight. To him that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit's saying unto the church. Let's stand together this evening. Tonight, I just want the piano to play very quietly. This is a type of message that uh, not many typically respond to because they don't want to be the ones that are going to expose secret sin. So tonight, I'm asking you there where you stand to confess it. Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I don't know who else you were speaking to, but I know first you were speaking to me. So Lord, I acknowledge it. Most often the issue of secret sin is that it's not that we don't know what that sin is. It's that we've minimized what that sin is. That's the danger of secret sin. Tonight, if you don't know him as Savior, perhaps that's the sin, the sin of faithlessness. You just never placed your faith in Christ. While Josh sings this next stanza, why don't you meet me up front? I'd love for somebody to take the word of God. Just meet me down front here. Just me and you. Nobody's looking around. Let somebody take the word of God and share with you. are coming tonight to receive the offering. As we go to the Lord in prayer, um, if you'd just play behind me, I want to just say a couple of things during the offering. Let's go to God in prayer and ask his blessing on the offering tonight. I want to say thank you to the church throughout the summer, your faithfulness and giving now as we're coming into the school year. I just want to say thank you, and I want to encourage you to keep that up as we enter now. This is kind of an ebb and flow. We're coming kind of into a strong growth cycle as you come into the September uh, month, and so I'm very grateful for how the church stayed consistent in giving throughout the summer, and so thank you for being an encouragement to your pastor in that way. Father, we lift up this offering to you. I pray tonight that we're faithful. Once again, as you've been faithful to us in giving to us, may we be faithful in giving back to you. And Lord, I pray that tonight we just acknowledge how blessed we have been by you through our giving. In Jesus' name we ask it, amen. So while they're taking offering, let me say this to you. Tonight when you go home, please don't forget, you're going to go eat, you're going to go perhaps get with other church members and have a time of fellowship. I think that's very good. But don't forget the message tonight. And so tonight before you go to bed, take some time to pray. There is a beautiful rest, restoration that takes place in a believer's life through confession. And that's something you can do directly because of Christ to God. He already knows. So look, it's not, you're not fooling him, right? We're not, we're not tricking him. He already knows. So when you come to him, he's inviting you to come. Just confess it. Just, I already know. Just, confess, just tell me what it is. 
and let's start this restoration process. And the beauty of that is, is that forgiveness because of Christ for purposes of fellowship is immediate. The fellowship is restored. That's the beauty of grace. The relationship was never in question, if you know him as Savior. And then allow the rebuilding process to take place. So I don't want you walking out of here with this sense, oh, my word, I, I just feel, it just feels so heavy upon me. It's such guilt, okay? And let me tell you this, guilt to the soul, is, as Wearsby says, is pain to the body. It's telling you something's wrong. So I don't apologize for that. If there's something you need to deal with, then deal with it. But deal with it now. Deal with it while it's still between you and God. Get that in the open between the two of you. And allow confession and restoration to take place. And then tomorrow, when you go back to work, go back to school, then it's a fresh start. His mercies are new every morning. His loving kindnesses are being poured out on you once again. Let that be what you take with you tonight. The importance of confession. The importance of restoration. And the beauty of forgiveness and his loving kindness. So let's walk in that. But first, we have to say about our sin what he says about it. We have to acknowledge that what we've done is against him. I don't know why he had me preach it, but then I do. So please heed his word tonight. All right? I love this church very much. I never want us to get to a place where we don't take time to share with each other. I want our children to always remember that. I'm like Emily. I love this church. What a privilege for us to be together for such a time as this. God's going to do his work either way, but he's invited us to be a part of it. What a beautiful thing. Now let's walk in the beauty of that. Good night.